Today on What It's Like, we are down in Beaver, Pennsylvania, where I saw this 1963 Studebaker Gran Turismo Hawk, or GT Hawk for short. Before getting into all of the specs about the GT Hawk, I'm Jay, welcome to What It's Like. This channel, we feature the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that are off the beaten path. This channel is so much more than walking around a car with music. We dive in deep, give specs and perceptions other channels simply don't show. If that sounds of interest to you, subscribe. Hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. If you would like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below. I read every single comment posted, and I'm not saying that for self-promotion. I'm just saying that there are some channels out there that's like you're talking to a wall. This channel is not like that. You will get a response. The other way is we recently made a Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. There is no obligation to join, just simply saying that it's a thing, and if you want to check it out, the link is in the description. Before getting into the Hawk, let's talk about the 1963 Studebaker lineup. The lineup consisted of Lark, which was broke down as Lark Daytona, Cruiser, Lark Wagoneer, Avante, which for those that don't know what the Avante was, it was the fastest car in the world in 1963. It was designed by Raymond Lowy, was constructed of fiberglass, and for all intents and purposes, it was Studebaker's swan song. Let's talk 1963 Gran Turismo Hawk. Actually, let's go back to 1962. The Hawk was given a totally new redesign by Brooks Stevens. Stevens went with a more European inspired look. To me, I see a lot of Mercedes Benz influences in this design. Stevens even codenamed this new Hawk Hawk Monaco. Stevens was able to give the Hawk a much needed facelift and or redesign because the Hawk at that point in time was a six year old design. Studebaker executives loved the redesign. Not only did they love the design, but they loved the fact that Stevens was able to get it done fast and on a shoestring budget, but not everybody was happy. Raymond Lowy, who was the designer of the 1953 Studebaker Starliner, which would eventually evolve into the Golden Hawk and then the later Hawk and then redesigned by Stevens, to be the Hawk GT was really distraught when he saw for the very first time the Studebaker Gran Turismo Hawk at the 1961 Paris Auto Show. He could not understand how Studebaker could allow Brooks Stevens to modify his firm's 1953 Studebaker Starliner design so extensively. You have to understand in 1962 Studebaker was hemorrhaging money big time. They were in financial turmoil. They could see the writing on the wall. If they didn't design something good that sold great, they were going to cease to exist. They gave up the Packard brand in 1958. For those that don't know, Packard actually bought Studebaker in the early 50s so they could survive the 50s, but the only reason Packard died was because they didn't know Studebaker's financial turmoil that they were in. They got catfished, for a lack of a better term, and Packard fell on the sword to save Studebaker. The hard pill to swallow was Studebaker was making wagons since before the Civil War, but now pressures were mounting from within to abandon automobile production. Some say Studebaker was slowly dying ever since its brush with bankruptcy in the early 30s, but material production had brought a lot of capital during World War II, and the future looked promising in 1946. The challenges and opportunities were there. The problem was management consistently took the wrong turn at every crossroads. Studebaker made the GT Hawk from 1962 to 1964. Let's talk specs. 204 inches long, 71 inches wide, 54.6 inches tall. It rides a wheelbase of 120 and a half inches long, weighs 3,230 pounds, price $3,095, which is equivalent to you spending $29,970 and two cents in the year 2022. What a bargain price. You can't get a car of that quality for that price now. Production, total Studebaker production. This is across all of the lines, 64,555, of which 4,634 GT Hawks were produced. 
1963 saw three performance versions of the GT Hawk. Don't crucify me in the comment section if I get any of this wrong because there is a lot of conflicting information out there and sources aren't, it's not cut and dry. Like one source will say this and then another source will say something else and something else, another source will say something completely different than those other two sources. So it was offered in three different flavors. The R1 had a jet thrust engine, which was a naturally aspirated 289 making 240 horsepower. Moving up to the R2, they added a supercharger to that engine. 289 cubic inch displacement engine. This engine made one horsepower per cubic inch with the supercharger, 289 horsepower. At the very top was the R3, super rare, low volume, had a 305 V8, which was supercharged. It produced 335 horsepower. Fun fact that I learned from a Studebaker owner at a car show earlier this year, Studebaker used kingpins until the day they stopped making cars because they technically didn't go out of business. They just stopped making cars. Moving on to engine specs. Now, these are just baseline numbers, and the especially for the stroke, compression, and bore, all those numbers might vary. Some of source might have rounded it to the next decimal point, but getting back to it, 289 cubic inch displacement V8, 4.7 liters, produced anywhere between 170 and 210 brake horsepower at 4,500 RPM, 305 foot-pounds of torque at 2,800 RPM. With a bore of 3.56 inches and a stroke of 3.62 inches, compression was 8.50 to 1. This one was fed with a two-barrel carburetor. There was another version of the 289 cubic inch displacement V8, 4.7 liters. It produced 289 horsepower. It was supercharged. It was fed with a four barrel carburetor, five main bearings, block slash crankcase is made out of cast iron. Moving on to transmissions, lots of different transmissions on offer. Three speed manual, which was a column shift manual, three speed manual with overdrive, four speed manual, which was a four shift, four speed, flight omatic column shift unit or power shift, which was another automatic transmission and it was floor mounted. Moving on to some key features or options that stood out. Power front caliber disc brakes. The advertisement claims first on a U.S. production car, but we found out that that's not 100% true, being that the Crosley Hot Shot or the Crosley Super Shot started that first. But I think these are the first powered ones. In the comment section below, if there was any car that came before this, the advertisement says that, but advertisements prove to be wrong sometimes. This car featured a split brake master cylinder, oftentimes referred to as a dual master cylinder reservoir. It had one reservoir for the rear brakes and another reservoir for the front brakes. You're probably at home sitting there wondering, well, when did the dual master cylinder become mandatory? Most car companies made the switch by 1967 model year, but they didn't really become mandatory slash standard equipment on all cars until January 1st of 1968. So let's talk about this door panel. Notice it has this nice chrome trim at the top here. Nice armrest here. Different materials like a leather slash vinyl type of material here. This is like aluminum or stainless carpet down in here. This is the window crank for the big window. And just notice it's all nice and trimmed out. The rear windows go down as well in this car. Just look at how they go down. Coming back to this window, got nice vent windows here. And this is the door handle they get out. Coming down here to the pedal box, got clutch, brake, gas pedal. This is for the overdrive, that's for the hood. Emergency brake here. While down inside this pedal box, this lever here, when you pull it up like this, it opens a vent on the outside that allows cold air to come down in here and blow at your feet and make the driving experience more of a pleasant one. It's up this vent. There is vents on both sides, driver's side and the passenger side controlled by this on to the button switches and knobs starting all the way to the left and moving right clock there are two gauges right next to it in a weird shape it almost looks like the silhouette of the number eight 
two gauges. The top gauge is the water temperature gauge. The bottom gauge is the aperture gauge. Moving to the right, speedometer with odometer inside of it. Moving to the right, another Silhouette 8 two gauge setup. Top gauge is for fuel, bottom gauge is for oil pressure. Moving to the bottom of the dash, starting back at the left hand side, ignition, headlights, instrument panel lights, that slider switch that you see, it, that's the on and off switch for the defroster. Moving to the center, just below the speedometer, those are the turn signal indicators. That other slider that you see, that one controls the heater being on and off. Right next to it are the windshield wipers, then air, then the cigarette lighter. Just to the right of that, or in the center of the dashboard, is the Studebaker radio. So here's the over the hood impression of what it looks like. This is the first person impression. Sun visors up here on the top. No courtesy mirrors. There's a nice rear view mirror there. This is underneath the steering wheel and how much room we have. This is how much room I have. Lots of headroom, adequate headroom. I love the over the hood impression of this car. It looks absolutely amazing. Ashtray here as well as center console. All right, moving on to the glove box test. If the camera does not fit in the glove box, does that mean that it's a bad car? No, I just like showing that this huge camera can fit in a seemingly tight or small glove box. It doesn't fit. So I just wanted to show you this. This is the hood prop, but notice where the hood prop goes. It goes inside the hood, but it's like on the bottom of the hood. Specific spot for it. Just check out this engine. Look at the valve covers are all thin. I love that thin look. Here's a glimpse of what the trunk looks like. Look at the trunk liner. I love the plaid. Looks like a full size spare there. Bumper jack off to the side on the right hand side. Looks like a very spacious trunk, all things considered. On to the pros and cons. I'm getting all of these pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars, Blue Chip Auto Investment, 70 years from 1930 to 2000 by Richard M. Langworth and the auto editors of Consumer Guide. On the positive side, milestone car status, styling, outstanding performance, deft interior, against it, rust prone, poor component accessibility, all vinyl 1962 upholstery is not very durable. In my opinion, I like the 56 better in the styling department, in the interior department, over the hood department. But I never really got the chance of looking at both of these side by side. Not saying that this car sucks, just saying I like that car better. But I can see where people like this one and they have lots of performance options and engines that were way superior to the Golden Hawk from 1956. All right, it's time for Name That Tune. First person to give me the correct band name and title of song will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. Looking for both the correct name of the band and or group, as well as song title, first person to do so will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. As always, if you could uh, please like and share this channel. We're trying to hit 10,000 by September, by the end of September. And until next time, I pop, 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 I p